If you want to have peace, create justice. If you want to have justice, live sustainably. And it's a very simple equation. And until we get it right, then more horrific scenes like the ones that we've become so familiar with over the past couple of weeks are going to be with us for a very long time. Barry Gardner, Labour MP. Hello, how are you? Yeah, very well, thanks, yeah. Good, glad to have you here. Thanks for coming into the studio. Um, we're going to talk about the situation in Israel-Palestine and the Labour Party's position on that yep. situation. Sure. Um, for the sake of those who aren't familiar with where the Labour Party as a sort of institution, as the leader sets it out, what is the Labour Party's official position on the conflict at the moment? Well, look, everybody abhors uh, what happened on October 7th. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, recognises that there is huge back context to this. And, and, and Keir Starmer has made that very clear. Um, I think the, the points of divergence, if I can put it that way, um, are over the issue of whether there should be a humanitarian pause um, to allow in food, water, supplies, fuel, so on, um, and, and then just let the fighting resume, or whether there should be real pressure put on for a ceasefire. Um, now, I suppose m my difference with, with Keir on this is that he says a ceasefire leaves the situation frozen. He says it freezes the situation as it was, it doesn't move things forward. Well, actually, that's precisely what a humanitarian pause does. A humanitarian pause freezes the situation, says, OK, allow people to get something to eat, allow them to, to, to get supplies in, um, but then we just resume the conflict. I, I feel that's a council of despair, and, and I, I don't think... Um, that's our job as politicians. I think we have to put on international pressure, um, both on uh, the government of Israel and on Hamas, um, to actually engage in a ceasefire. Now, ceasefires only come with huge international pressure building up behind them. And, and so far, apart from the Secretary General of the United Nations and all the major aid agencies and donor agencies, it hasn't come from a political source. And I, I recognize that it's, it's um, difficult to move when Joe Biden and the Americans haven't moved. But actually, you know, that's one of the luxuries of opposition. You can take moral leadership in a situation like this because a ceasefire can be really helpful in moving things forward. And, and, and that's what I, I really think our party needs to grasp. Because a ceasefire isn't just a, a temporary pause. It's not just a freezing of the situation. In a ceasefire, you can actually have inspection regimes going in from the United Nations. So all the fears that Israel has that the Al-Quds Hospital and other schools and hospitals are being used as human shields by Hamas. And, and that is, that's such an awful, vile thing for any putative authority to do, to, to use the most vulnerable people in their own community mm. as a human shield. Um, they say they're not doing it. Israel says they have um, intelligence that shows that they are. And I think Candidly, I think probably many people in the world believe that that's true. Um, I can tell you it wasn't the leadership of the party getting in touch with me. Uh, so I, I, I'm glad to know they, they haven't got their, uh, their, their, their your Wire microphones yeah. attuned to you. There we are. Um, but sorry about that. That's okay. You were, talk um, you were talking about um, inspectors going into yeah, Gaza. Look, um, Inspectors could go in. They could establish safe zones around the hospital or not. They could say, OK, what we need to do is we need to, to bring out those people who, at the moment, the doctors are saying that we can't 
we can't transport these people through a war zone. Mm. Um, th these people are in intensive care. They're on life support. Um, so there would be a way of, of getting those people out of the situation and, and actually understanding what the, the reality of it is. It's a way in which you can begin to talk about swapping prisoners for hostages. It's a way in which you can begin to talk about swapping the military infrastructure that Hamas has for land that Israel has illegally occupied. Now, these are the ways which incrementally it may be possible to move this conflict forward. Nobody is, is you know, naive enough to think that suddenly we're going to get negotiations about a two-state solution, it's all going to be fine. Mm. Um, but for as long as a ceasefire holds, people have stopped dying, and dialogue is ultimately what we need. Mm. I'd like to um, pick up on a phrase you used during that answer. You, you said moral leadership in yeah. relation to a ceasefire. You said it was one of the luxuries of opposition that you can, you can occupy that space. Am I to infer then that your view is failing to, a, failing to support a ceasefire <laughs> is a moral failure? Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not anybody's ethics judge, right? All I'm trying to do is engage in a debate within our party and it's a, it's a vitally important debate. Mm. People are dying in, in, in the most horrendous numbers. Um, children are dying. We've, we've seen the, the news, we've seen the video reports. It's an appalling situation. And, you know, it's not a matter of sitting back and, you know, wringing our hands and, or, or or sitting back and 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 saying, you know, isn't Hamas terrible? Isn't the Israeli government terrible? It's not about that. Supporting the people does not mean that you support the pe the governments of those people. Mm. Um, but we have to be mindful that in war, in a conflict. International law is very clear about what can happen and what cannot happen. And it's what can happen to the people. No military objective, no political objective overrides those human rights, overrides those rules of engagement, the need to protect civilian life as much as you possibly can. Mm. Yes, there there is collateral damage. We understand that. But there are certain principles which have to be followed. Uh, and I think we need to be absolutely clear what they are. And, you know, it, it's painful when, when we see what is going on. And yes, it's, it, it's difficult to judge what is proportionate and what is not. And these are always, always difficult moral judgments. But it's a debate we have to have. Mm. And there's no point shying away from it. There's no point in saying that actually this doesn't matter. We're only the opposition party. E even if we were the government, what real influence could we have on the situation if the Americans didn't move? All of that's true. But our job as a politician is to try and bring hope into the situation. It's try, to try and chart that way forward so that others can, can then do that heavy lifting. Um, and we all know that this is not going to, to find a resolution unless the other countries in the area really get involved and, and apply the pressure that only they can put on and, you know, I'm, by that I mean only they can put on Hamas. Mm. Um, the Americans couldn't put pressure on the Israelis. It's the regional powers that need to put pressure on Hamas. Uh, and, and, but we can try and suggest the ways in which incrementally that can be done. Because, you know, I, look, I'm a former Northern Ireland minister, right? I, I know that peace does not come from the barrel of a gun. 
You know, how many times have we said that? Mm. Um, it comes from talking to the other side, no matter how how offensive, no matter how vile you think they are, you have to talk because that's the space that creates life. A word then um, on this debate and about the sort of domestic Labour Party politics um, of this. There's divergence, isn't there, within the Labour Party? You're, re you're referencing a debate. Oh, there's, yeah, there's, a, there's divergence of views, and actually that's... I'm sure there's divergence in all political no, of course, parties. Of course there yeah. is, but I'm, uh, the reason I'm highlighting it is because um, it's a relative rarity, I guess, in Keir Starmer's Labour Party that actually sort of um, dissenting voices... I'm not, I'm not sort of saying, like, you know, open rebellion and, and that sort of thing, but a degree of dissent, a degree of debate, and a degree of discussion is being permitted, isn't there, by, by the Labour leadership, which perhaps hasn't always been present on, on other issues? Look, um, I, I have been a member of the Labour Party for 40, I don't know, 40, 44, 45 years. A long, a long time? A long time. <laughs> um, and there's always debate in the Labour Party. There's always differences of opinion in the Labour Party. That, it, my God, if we didn't have, we wouldn't be a political party. Mm. You know, we'd be, we're, we'd be an autocracy. Um, it's wonderful that we have that debate. It's wonderful that we have those different shades of opinion because it's in, in, in expressing our views, in thinking about what the other person says, in listening to the other side of the debate that we actually can better form our own opinions and our own views. And that's why it's so important that the Labour Party remains this open debating forum for people. Mm. Yes, we know we're on generally the center left of, of, of political society in the UK, but within those bounds, we have to be able to differ in our views because that's what refines our views. That's what actually makes them relevant. If I could come back to you on the ceasefire then, uh, the sort of one of the main lines of argument against uh, a ceasefire has been that it is essentially an opportunity for Hamas to rearm, re-strengthen itself and renew its assault then on Israel. Um, what do you make of that argument? Well, look, it's, it's a very sensible argument. Of course it is. Uh, but that's why I say it's, it's the terms and conditions under which a ceasefire takes place that are important. It's that negotiating process. And of course, I would say that in order to counteract something like that happening, you have to have the United Nations able to put in an inspection regime. That There has to be a way of going in and actually demilitarizing the situation, actually addressing that whole point, that fear. But of course, you're not going to get that without give and take on, on both sides. Hamas is not going to simply say, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll allow you to destroy our military infrastructure unless there's something in return. And there is something that Israel could give, and there is something which Israel under international law um, is obliged to give, and that is those illegally settled uh, pieces of land. So, you know, this is, this is a way that if we talk about these things, if we talk about what's possible, if we, if we get both sides actually maybe in separate rooms, you know, like we did in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. um, but actually communicating, then there's a possibility of moving things forward. As it is, um, what effectively the world is saying at the moment is, yes, just go on fighting. And I don't believe that's right. I don't believe that it is beneficial to the people of Gaza. I don't believe it's beneficial to the people of Israel. I believe that the ongoing bombardment that we're seeing is only creating the next generation of Hamas terrorists. And it's, it's almost playing into Hamas's hands they knew what they were doing when they launched that attack on October the 7th. Mm. They knew how much support they'd been losing amongst the Palestinian people, and that was well documented at the time. Um, and therefore, they needed something that made them look like the protector of the Palestinian people 
against Israel as the aggressor. That's why they engineered that situation, I believe, on October the 7th. Um, you know, we have to call out terror. We have to do that. We also have to understand the strategy that they have and not play into their hands. And that's why I believe that we need to negotiate the ceasefire because it's doing neither peoples any good. Yeah, they've. Just, I guess that action has almost essentially eternalized war, hasn't it? Because the the note the attack is sort of so total, so horrific that it that the prospect it puts the prospect of peace further and further away. Barry, just finally, a um, a word on the humanity, I guess, of this situation because, you know, I, I I'm not looking to impose you know a moral judgment on it. The the loss of life, the destruction. Uh, to put it bluntly, the horror that we're seeing come out of this region. I just sort of um, invite you to comment on 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 what we've seen seen of it so far, and perhaps kind of the uh, the personal impact, perhaps that it's that it's had on you. I I don't think there's anyone who who has seen what we've seen on our TV screens and on social media. I, I I've actually refused to put anything on on social media. Um, about this because it's so horrific and and I think Twitter is not an appropriate place to you know to be doing discussing something like yeah. this you can't do that um, but you know I'd I would put it wider we've had huge absolutely correct that the, the the world's media has focused its attention on the horrors of what happened in in the terrorist attack uh, and in the horrors of what's happening continuously in the bombardment of, of of Gaza it's right that we see the human suffering it's right that we abhor that what's happening in the horn of africa you know millions are dying there uh, from famine and from war Look at it all around the world. Um, and you have to say, why, you know, w of course it, it's right to focus on, on one area, but we have to actually think more widely about how we create a future that is going to be freer of conflict than the one that we are living through. Because we can't just go from one conflict to another, focusing on the horrors of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, focusing on the horrors of the Hamas attack on Israel, focusing on um, Yemen, focusing on Syria. There is something deeply dysfunctional in our international order. Uh, and it comes, you know, if you want to have peace, create justice. If you want to have justice, live sustainably. And it's a very simple equation. And until we get it right, then more horrific scenes like the ones that we've become so familiar with over the past couple of weeks are going to be with us for a very long time. Barry Gardner MP, thank you so much.